Welcome to Sales Players, the number one podcast for top players in B2B sales. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out in the world of sales, this is the show for you. We're all about bringing you fresh, actionable ideas to supercharge your rev gen game. We dive deep into the mindset, habits, and tools used by top performers in the industry, generate more leads, close more deals, and build wealth and financial security in B2B sales. So if you're ready to level up, you've come to the right place. Join the conversation with other like-minded sales players and continue the discussion beyond the show. Hit the subscribe button, tune into the sales players, and let's start winning together. This episode is sponsored by Accord. Accord helps revenue teams drive execution excellence by enforcing their standards for how they sell, onboard, and expand with prospects and customers. Revenue teams can ensure flawless execution of value selling, med pick, account planning, business cases, mutual action plans, and more with Accord's deal execution platform. If you've been a longtime listener of the show, you've probably already heard me talk about how I use mutual action plans, account plans, and business cases to manage and close my enterprise deals. Well, Accord has created a better way to manage the process. They're your solution for deal execution. Your buyers are going to love it because it makes their evaluation process so much easier by helping them seamlessly validate and onboard new and existing vendor partners. I've been super excited to be using Accord to manage my six and seven figure enterprise deals. So for sales players looking to get started with Accord for free, use the link in the show notes to sign up today. Hey, sales players. Before we dive back into the conversation, I wanted to introduce you to a game changer in the lead generation tool arena, and it's called Lead Feeder. Imagine having the power to identify companies visiting your website, tracking their behavior in real time, seamlessly integrating this data in your CRM. Lead Feeder is not just a tool, it's your secret weapon for efficient and targeted lead engagement. What sets Lead Feeder apart is its ability to provide detailed insights into visitor behavior, helping your sales team to prioritize efforts and close deals faster. Ready to revolutionize your approach to leads and deals? Head over to leadfeeder.com for your free demo today. That's L-E-A-D-F-E-E-D-E-R dot com. Don't miss out on the future of successful lead generation with Lead Feeder. Plus, if you go to the show notes, we actually have a special link that will give you a 21-day free trial instead of the normal 14-day free trial. Go over today and sign up. What's happening, sales players? It's Jesse, and it's actually just me today because it's a random Saturday afternoon. And I had the idea to put together a quick episode on something that I think will help a lot of you out there who are working on big deals specifically, but really any size deal. I thought this list would be helpful for anyone working on a deal that keeps having their prospects go dark or disappear or ghost you. So this is the top 10 reasons your prospects are ghosting you in your deals. I'm going to start at number 10, and that is you didn't establish the next steps or the next step. So you might have not been proactive in making sure you'd secured the next step in the process. Maybe you had a first meeting and you didn't schedule a second meeting or a second thing that they need to do to continue to evaluate your product. This is super common, especially if you're early on in your career, learning the art of asking for next steps is just that it's an art form. So it is something you need to get into a habit of doing though on every single call you have, every single interaction you have should be guided or geared towards setting those next steps. So an example of that for a first meeting might be great, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect. Typically what we do at this point is we do a second call to do deeper discovery or we do a demo of our product or we begin to understand, you know, this audit or something like that, you know, whatever custom thing to your product or solution that you want to secure as, as the next step in the process, take the charge, be proactive about it and ask for the next steps, but ask in a way that you're an expert in the process, really sound confident in your sales cycle and guide them through the process as an expert would. So again, that might sound something like, yeah, typically what we do at this stage with other customers like you is we would do a demo session so you can see the product in action, or we would do a deeper dive into your requirements. Whatever that next step is, make sure you're always asking for those next steps. And again, every single interaction is going to have a next step. When you do have that demo, the next step might be great. Now that you've seen the demo, 
we want to dig into the business value of this. And so we're going to set up another call to talk about the business case, or we might set up a proposal review call, whatever that is for your product. Just make sure you're always asking and proposing the next thing as an expert, again, a consultant to them, you're recommending the next step based on what's historically worked well with your customers. And even if you haven't been through a deal cycle before, just use the example of existing customers at your company as that guiding point of, Hey, yeah, look, there's typically a process for this and here's how we do it. Here's how I recommend we proceed. And if you can deliver that really confidently, you'll always get those next steps. So number nine is you miss something during your discovery. This means that you might've not asked the right questions or the right set of questions. You might've misheard something. You might've misunderstood the intent behind the project or who's in charge of the project or what the impact is on the business. There's something off. And a lot of times if you don't do the appropriate level of discovery where you've really got a good understanding of why they're evaluating products, what the pain that, that they're trying to get solved is, who the stakeholders are in the project and a number of other things that you need to try to understand. So there's always, you know, most companies and teams have some kind of methodology for discovery. I would recommend knowing your company's discovery methodology really well, whatever that is, and make sure that you're really understanding on a deep level why they're even talking to you in the first place. And that's usually the thing that I open most calls up with is what piqued your interest and made you agree to a call or what, what prompted you to meet with us today? It's the number one question to ask. And then from there, it guides the conversation towards great. What's the time frame for this? You know, what's the, what's not working today with your current solution? Or do you not have a solution today? Who would be responsible for this project? Who are the stakeholders? Who would make the final decision on this? Who would be sponsoring it from the leadership level? So those are some of the other questions you can ask. And I'm, I'm going really high level here. Of course, every product and service has very unique things you can ask about. Uh, specifically around maybe what they're doing today or what their current tech stack looks like or whatever that is, but, but always be doing as much discovery as you can in a way that's showing, Hey, look, I really want to understand your business so well that I can help guide you through this process and make the right recommendations. So that's the, the posture you want to take. And uh, yeah, make sure that you've done enough discovery. One of the biggest reasons that your deals will evaporate or your prospects will ghost you is you didn't do enough discovery. You missed something or there was some other thing that they wanted to see that you didn't show, or you didn't hit on some pain point that wasn't captured during those initial discovery sessions. Number eight is your deal isn't multi-channel. This is one of my favorite ones because we get into a habit often as sellers to just focus on email as the primary channel and the, the Zoom meetings that you do as part of the deal cycle. But what we miss is the opportunity to text our prospects or buyers, which is a tactic I've used over the years that's been super effective. Because if you can get on a texting basis with a buyer, you're in a really good spot and you can get a lot more interaction. You can get a lot more transparency in some cases and you have access to them. They really can't ghost you if you have their cell number. I mean, they can, but it's a little harder for them to just disappear. So I think it's a really good sign when your buyer, your prospect allows you to, to get into a texting conversation with them. Cause it says that they're willing to engage with you on this personal level where uh, they can respond a lot quicker than they, they might an email. They're a lot more reachable. So getting your prospects over to SMS. The other one I wrote down here was Slack. And I've talked about this before on the show, but one of the ways that I work on some of the strategic deals that I've done over the last few years was getting the team that's evaluating our solution into a shared Slack channel. And this started when I was at a startup a number of years ago, I think in 2018, I was at a startup company and the founders were like, let's build a Slack for prospects so we can answer some of their technical questions in real time and we can be there for them. And then I, that's sort of carried its way into other roles I've been in. And I talked about this on a podcast episode that I was interviewed on recently where we had the largest deal I did in my career. We had their technical team inside of a shared Slack community. And that way they could have access to our engineers and our technical folks. I'm doing that right now with a few of the deals that I'm working on today. We've got, you know, it makes it super easy for scheduling. It makes it really easy to go back and forth with any questions they have about the product. I can confirm things with them. I can continue to do discovery via Slack because they're in the same environment that I'm in every single day. So those are two examples of going multi-channel. There's obviously other ways you could do this. You could engage people on LinkedIn or on a social media platform. 
getting in person, I would consider a channel. So if you can get in person on a strategic deal, that's another, you know, platform or channel that's going to make your deal multi-channel. But what I've found is if you're just going back and forth on email with a prospect, it's really easy for them to just never respond to an email and disappear into the woodwork. And you never really understand what happened in the deal. So getting multi-channeled is a huge opportunity for your deal. And it's a really good sign that you're building a strong relationship with your buyer. Number seven I wrote down was you are not talking to power or the decision maker or someone who has access to power or access to the decision maker. You might be talking to someone who is a tire kicker who just wants to justify whatever they're doing nine to five by saying that they're talking to vendors or they want to know what's out there in the marketplace or they're doing research or whatever it is but you may not be talking to the person that has direct access to power or of course the person that has the, the power or the authority to move a project like this forward so one way to suss that out is to and i'm actually going to get to this, this is the number one point on the list so i won't uh, go too much on this because i want to get to it later but just push a little bit, you know, really pushing in a polite way to get some action done will help you suss out whether this person has access to power. And then you can just, of course, ask the question, you know, do who sponsors this? This is my favorite. One of my favorite questions to ask early on is uh, who sponsors this project? Is there someone on the team that that's, you know, responsible for the sponsorship of this at the exec level or the leadership level who would sign this paper? That's another way you can ask it. I don't like that one as much, but you know, just try to get to the bottom of who the stakeholders are, who would need to sign off on this in order for it to move forward. And that'll help you suss out who's a tire kicker versus who is power or access to power. Number six I wrote down was you are not multi-threaded and you don't have a champion. You're not multi-threaded and you don't have a champion. So what, what that means is you might be doing a deal and you're siloed to one individual who you're talking to for every interaction that person's gone through your demo they went through your intro call they've you know looked at the proposal they've talked about the next steps and all that stuff but they aren't bringing anybody else into the conversation and as time goes on in the business world more and more people are getting involved in the decision to buy technology or media or whatever you're selling and so it's super important to have a lot of threads and that means, you know, if you're selling, let's say a software platform, you probably want to have a thread with the IT team, as well as your buyer personas team, and then probably to the exec level, and then maybe even to the finance side of the business or the procurement side of the business. You want to have these multiple threads going so that you have more than one person talking to you about the project or the deal. That way, if one person leaves the company, gets fired, just completely disappears, uh, gets hit by a bus. But yeah, if somebody just goes away, then you still have more people you can reach out to on the team and say, Hey, I want to pick this project back up. It sounds like there's some kind of delay. I haven't heard back from this person. So I'm reaching out to you. So you want to have multiple stakeholders involved in your deals. And when I reflect back on the biggest deals that I closed in my career, the common theme was that we had either one or more executives responsible or, or, or involved in the deal at a very you know intimate level plus someone who was championing our solution within the organization. So they were telling other people that they needed to really seriously consider us. And then we had a lot of IT support. So a technical person on the, at the company who was willing to evaluate the what's under the hood and put this into the project queue for their technical team. So those are, those are themes that I've seen in my deals across my career is having, again, multiple threads. That way, if someone goes quiet on you, you can just reach out to someone else that you're uh, you know, in a relationship with the company. So multi-threaded champion is the other thing there. If you don't have someone who is going to bat for you internally, who is preparing an internal case or presentation, then you're going to have a really hard time closing a deal, especially if it's a large deal. You really have to sell those deals. You know, someone has to sell those deals internally and you as a seller can't always do that. You have to have a champion who's willing to go in and present this to the leadership team and I think it's Nate Nasrella who was on the podcast a while back that talks about how most of the most of the really important conversations in enterprise sales happen when you're not in the room. So a lot of your role as an enterprise or strategic seller is actually preparing your buyers, your prospects to go in and have these conversations with their leadership team and coaching them on how to internally sell this project. So that's number six. Let's see, number five, you aren't deploying executive peering. 
And I've talked about peering before on the podcast, but just as a recap, executive peering is the, the strategy of putting leadership titles peered with other leadership titles. So an example might be if the vice president of marketing has to sign off on your proposal, you might want to have your vice president of marketing or your vice president of sales connect with that person and build a relationship with that person because VPs like to talk to other VPs and C levels like to talk to other C levels and even director levels like to talk to other director levels. So if you're not of those titles, if you don't have a director or VP title and you're trying to sell, go and use your internal management team, your internal leadership team to peer with the you know director, vice president or C level at the company and to start to build that relationship. And so again, example from the largest deal I closed in my career, our vice president of sales was very well connected to their vice president. And then I had the founder of the company I was working for connected to the you know C-level officers in the business. And so everybody was talking to people that were their peers. And not only are you multi-threading, as we just talked about, you've got multiple stakeholders, but you're also kind of threading it on your side too, because you have now multiple fingerprints on your team connected to this deal. And that just helps because then if, again, if the deal goes quiet, if one prospect goes dark, you can reach out to other people on the thread. If one thread goes dark, then you can always have your, you know, if you're not getting anywhere reaching out, then you can always have your vice president reach out to their vice president, right? So it just really helps thread the deal well, build a really strong kind of core group of people that are all moving in the same direction. This is a real art form. It takes a long time to master these skill sets. And it takes a lot of practice and just repetitions, but after a while it becomes second nature to just start to plan and strategize how you're going to get, how you're going to get multi-threaded and how you're going to start to peer your executives with their executives and, and, and so forth. So that is number five. Number four is you haven't understood the W I I F M what's in it for me or what's in it for them. What is it that is motivating your champion or your primary contact at the deal to move this forward? And this is a, you know, again, another art form, something else that takes a lot of practice and strategy to master is being able to have a really frank conversation with your champion or your primary contact about what's in it for them. Why would they want to get this done? Or do they really care? Maybe they don't care. And again, they're just checking boxes or they're just burning hours because their boss told them to. So really trying to have a human conversation with your buyer and understand what their motivators are for evaluating your product and ultimately implementing your product or your solution. If you can figure out what that is, and in many cases that takes the shape of an end of the year bonus, maybe they'll get a promotion if they can switch platforms and be more effective, efficient, save money, whatever that is. They've got some goals. There's some reason that they're talking to you, especially in the middle of the deal cycle. You have to kind of think about why does this person keep talking to me? What's in it for them? Are they going to get promoted if this happens and goes well? Are they going to get a big end of year bonus? Are they going to get more stock options at their company? Are they trying to lift the stock price at their company? Are they trying to lower their costs so that they can capitalize on a bonus for that, that project? Like there's some motivator for them and maybe it's, maybe it's personal, maybe it's political on their side too. So having a really frank conversation with your champion, your buyer, really understanding what that is, what drives them will seriously help you out because then you can very tactfully always come back to that. If your buyer shares with you that they're trying to get a bonus, they're trying to make sure they hit their bonus for the end of the year, you can very politely bring that up when things go sideways in the deal or if things go quiet or slow down, you can always go back to the, Hey, I'm, here because I want to help you achieve your goal. Sounds like that goal is to get bonus at the end of the year, get your promotion, whatever it is. And I want to be here to help achieve that. And that's why we need to do this. Or that's why I would recommend we do this next to keep the train moving. Right? So what's in it for them really understanding what that is. And it takes building a lot of trust and authenticity with your buyers, with your prospects in order for them to feel comfortable sharing that a lot of times it's one of the hardest things for them to share, but if you can get them to share that, and you can bring it back up if you ever need to. And again, in a polite and tactful way, and it's a really powerful driver to keep the deal moving forward. And in many cases, moving it forward faster than, than anticipated. You can really move deals along quickly if you understand the motivators behind it. All right, we're getting to the top three here. 
Number three is you don't have a mutual action plan, milestones, and you don't have a clear timeline or time frame for when they want to purchase your solution. This is the number three reason. And I've talked a lot about mutual action plans on the show. And we actually just partnered with a really awesome startup called Accord. And uh, their link's in the show notes. I'm going to repaste that because it's a, an amazing product. When I first met the founder and he showed me a demo of what they were doing, it was exactly like what I'd been doing for years, but they've now productized it and put it into a SaaS offering. So you can manage a mutual action plan with your buyers. And again, hopefully it's buyers because you're trying to multi-thread your deals. You want to have multiple stakeholders on the side of your prospect. And you can use a cord to actually map out step-by-step step how to get the deal done. This is one of the most effective ways, if not the most effective way to manage the time frame of your deal and to ensure that it gets done and to make sure that you can address all of the many things that are required for getting a deal across the line. And so Accord helps you map out the steps. You can go through and say, all right, our next step is to go through a demo. Then we need to get an NDA in place. Then we need to do a proposal review and then we need to do a business case. And then we need to talk to the procurement team and then we need to talk to the CFO and then we need to talk to the IT security team. And then we need to go through a legal review and then we need to sign the contract and then we need to implement the product, right? And that's going to take this long. And if you can map all that out and then work backwards, you can kind of control when the deal closes because you can propose a, a date for the signature on the, on the contracts and then work backwards week over week to achieve every single milestone. So again, Accord makes this super easy because the prospect can update the milestones on their side and you can see when they're doing that and you can add stakeholders in so multiple people can be looking at all the different milestones and planning accordingly. Maybe that's why it's called Accord because you can plan accordingly. So highly recommend mutual action plans. Go check out Accord. It's a really cool tool to do this, but having this mutual action plan as a guide for both you and the prospect is going to help you build a lot of credibility. They're gonna stop thinking about you as a sales rep and start thinking about you as a consultant or advisor to their team and to their company because you're showing them step-by-step, milestone-by-milestone, how they can execute on this project effectively, how they can, and, you know, bring, again, bringing in other team members to help them do that. And you're mitigating any risks in the deal process by having these mutual action plans you're also just plotting out exactly the timeframes and sticking to those timeframes. It's going to help you be more consistent in your forecasting and it's going to help you close deals faster, essentially, because you're going to be able to propose the signature date and see how they feel about it and then show them how you're going to get there. It's really awesome. Highly recommend mutual action plans. If you don't understand the timing or the time frame of the project or deal, and by the way, this spans all the way up to the exec level, because a lot of times you're talking to a champion who wants this done this month or next month or next quarter, but execs have other priorities that are underway that need to be resolved or, or completed first before they can start another project. And if you've ever read Skip Miller's book, Selling Above and Below the Line, he talks about the concept of trains running on time. Execs think about things in terms of, you know, trains leaving and arriving from a station. It's a really great analogy on how to time things in, you know, the broader business objectives. So Go check that book out too. Really, really great stuff. So number two is you've not nailed down your business case. You haven't quantified their pain and you haven't mapped your product or solution. Uh, you haven't mapped your product or solution back to their pain points. So this is huge. When you're doing a large strategic deal, you have to be able to show the business value, the business case behind your solution. Are you going to help them make more money? Are you going to help them save money? Are you going to help them mitigate risk in some way? And then how does that financially impact them? How does it impact their share price if they're a public company? How will it help them reduce costs over a long period of time? How will it help them be more efficient? Can they automate aspects of their business? So these are the things that are going to go into your business case. And you really need to start asking questions almost from the get-go of the deal on what is the financial impact of doing this? What does it cost you today? Uh, what does it cost you today to do this thing? And can our solution help you save costs on that? How much revenue are you driving from your current solution? And we want to show you how we think we can you know, exceed that or, or double that or triple that or whatever the, the metric is, but really start to understand 
you know, the, the quant side of things, what's, what, you know, what can you do to move the needle in terms of dollars and cents or numbers in their business? Again, dollars and cents, but also metrics. What metrics are they driving towards and how can you help them achieve those metrics? So understanding those and then being able to map those back to your product. So you can't just know your product features and say, Hey, we do this really cool thing where, uh, you know, a user can do X. You have to know that like the thing that your product or solution does, it does X. It's really cool. It has this really fun functionality, but here's why you should give a shit about that. Here's why that's going to move the needle in your business. It's going to either make you money, save you money, or mitigate your risks in some way that'll be beneficial to the health of the company. You can't just know features and functions in your product. You have to understand the financial impact. And then when you're doing a deal, you have to do enough discovery to understand the specific things, the specific drivers that are going to help make that financial impact for your prospect. So you can map those back to your product. You can map their specific pain or friction points back to your product, and you can provide them specific numbers. Again, a lot of times it's estimates, but you want to have that basis already built out. So this is not an art form. I guess it's more of a science than an art in, in selling to large deals, but being able to put together a strong business case and knowing how to ask for the right metrics and knowing what benchmarks are in the industry. And this is stuff that your, your team and your leadership should help you out on. You may even have someone on your sales or marketing team that is dedicated or sales enablement team also that is dedicated to understanding industry benchmarks and showcasing, you know, historicals that you've achieved with other customers or estimates for what's possible with your product. But again, your role as the seller is to always map those back to the pain points of the prospect and be able to showcase why your product, why they should give a shit about your product in terms of an actual quantified number. So that's number two, business case. All right, the last one and the number one on my list of top 10 reasons your prospects might be ghosting you is you are not introducing enough friction in your deal cycle. Friction. What does that mean? You're running deal cycles and you're being polite and you're just kind of hoping, waiting after every next step. You might be setting next steps. You might be doing all of the other nine things on this list, but you're not pushing for friction. And let me give you a quick example of friction. One early way to introduce friction in a large enterprise deal is to ask to get a non-disclosure agreement in place, a mutual non-disclosure agreement or an MNDA. What this does is it starts to kind of condition the prospect into signing things for you, which is really important in a deal cycle. If you can get a signature on an NDA, it's a small micro step in a very long process to ultimately get a signature on an order form. And this might sound really cheesy, but it's true. If you can get that commitment early on, then it shows that there's you're starting to build this relationship of give, get. And so you're introducing friction early on if you say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect, typically what we do as a next step is we get an NDA in place so we can begin to explore deeper our product and your you know, pain points. We can use you know, our template to do that or we can use your template. How would we go ahead and get that signed? And if they go and do that pretty quickly, then you've removed, you've pushed for some friction and you've moved the ball in the deal cycle to a point where paperwork is getting signed between your companies. So it might seem like a small thing, but it is, you know, introducing some friction into the deal. If you have a prospect that refuses to do that, then you might need to go back to the drawing board and say, I don't understand what, you know, the hesitation is here. And maybe there's not a real project here if you're not willing to execute on an NDA document. Another example is a proof of concept. Super common in larger enterprise strategic deals is, hey, why don't we run a four to six week proof of concept or a two week proof of concept. It doesn't really matter the time interval. It's going to be different for every company, but let's get your technical resources and our technical resources working together inside of our technology or inside of our platform to build out some use cases. And then let's have a touch base every other week or every week where we can talk about what we accomplished. That's introducing some friction. They've got to commit the time and the resources as part of that. And if they're not willing to do that, then it begs the question, is there really a time sensitive active deal here? Or is this just tire kicking? The business case can also be a, you know, an example of friction. So having, having, you know, starting to ask for some of the metrics and starting to put together some of the quantifying of their pain points 
is introducing friction. If they're not willing to share some of those things with you, then you might not have a deal. An active deal, someone who's really serious about buying your solution should have no hesitation, especially if you've already got an NDA in place in sharing some of their business metrics that they're trying to achieve and what's relevant to you know the, the evaluation at hand. So those are some just quick examples. Even getting a demo could be friction. Hey, let's get this on the books and let's get your broader team involved in this demo. Can we get the three or four people that are on this project scheduled for 60 minutes to go through a demo? If they're not willing to commit to that, then you don't have enough friction and you probably don't have an active deal. So introducing little points of friction where you're just pushing a little bit towards a step that they have to take on their side. It's usually mutual though, because again, signing a mutual NDA, doing a proof of concept, these are all mutual milestones in the project, but it's really telling if you ask for something like that and the prospect is like, nah, I don't know. I don't really want to commit to putting an NDA in place just yet. Okay. Why is this not an active deal yet? Or I must be off on something. Maybe the timing isn't, isn't right here, or maybe you don't have the authority to go do this. And that's something I need to suss out as a seller is if you're not the power or have access to power and you can't get an NDA signed, then we need to understand if there's someone else at the company that would be responsible for doing that. That is the authority or the power in this deal. Oh, you don't want to commit to a POC. Is that because you don't have the right to go ask for the IT resources to do that? What's the story here? So it, putting that friction out there, kind of pushing for some friction is a great way to really understand where you're at in the deal. One way to also think about it is I've heard it called like trial closing. And this is for more simplistic deals. Friction is a better, I think, analogy or better term when you're talking enterprise strategic deals. But a trial close is like, hey, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, what would stop us from getting the POC kicked off tomorrow? You know, you're, you're kind of like pushing for a little bit of friction. And if they start to panic and they're like, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. Then you know, okay, this person may not have the access to those resources or they may not be the right person uh, or the timing is off here. They're not ready to do that yet. So all very telling stuff, push for friction. That's the number one reason that your, your deals are ghosting you is you're not introducing friction into the process. And friction shouldn't be a negative thing. It's not you pushing on someone or badgering somebody to get something done. It's you introducing a mutual milestone that can sometimes be complex, but it's not really complex to sign an NDA, but it's very telling if a prospect's not willing to do that. So I hope this list was helpful. Good luck out there with those deals and uh, go check out Accord, as I said, awesome mutual action plan software. And thanks for tuning in. If you do any prospecting with LinkedIn, you have got to go get set up with Surf. That's S-U-R-F-E. It's a tool you can use to add new contacts to your CRM system directly from LinkedIn in seconds. I'm using it every single day. I add contacts, follow my deals, keep track of notes, and it ends up saving me a bunch of time on prospecting and outreach, which means I can spend more time moving my deals along. The data is always 100% accurate since I don't have to copy and paste all the fields over from each and every contact that I want to put in my CRM. Instead, Surf does that all automatically with just one click in about 60 seconds. The team over at Surf has put together a very special offer for fans of sales players. There's a link down in the show notes and you can use the promo code JWSURF5. Don't forget the E at the end of Surf. That's JWSURF5 for 5% off your first year. Don't spend another minute doing things manually. Go get set up with Surf.